Book of Fragapetti, Chapter Twenty Six. When Fragapetti entered the road of fire with his avalanche, where Athrava has stationed the musicians and groups of furlers, the host aboard broke loose from all bounds of propriety. So great was their delight, and they shouted and sang with the trumpeters with most exalted enthusiasm. Many of them entered the Orion stake, and not a few, even the Nervanian. And they became even as gods and goddesses by their entrancement, seeing, hearing, and realizing, even to the third rate above the brides and bridegrooms of Jehovah. Two, these were but spasmodic conditions of light from which they returned in course of time, being able to give descriptions of their visions. For Jehovah so created man with spells of clearness far in advance of his growth, the which he having realized. He returneth to his normal condition to prepare himself constitutionally. Three, along the road on either side were mottoes and sayings peculiar to the host of Hapacha and to mortals of Guatama. When Hapacha saw these, he said, "How was it possible? Whence derived these gods this information?" But the light came to his own soul, saying, "The wise and good sayings of men below are borne by Jehovah's swift messengers." To realms above, Hoab stood nearby and heard what Hapacha said. And Hoab said, "How can men and spirits be inspired to wise and good sayings? Who had thought to erect such signboards on the road to all light? And yet, what darker deeds are done when the soul of man findeth curses, curses and evil words to vent his awful sins, and walls himself around with horrid imprecations?" The which to face in after time and be appalled at the havoc of his own deadly weapons. How few indeed comprehend the direful thrust of hateful words, imagining them but wind to pass away and be seen no more, but which are placarded on the signboard of heaven as his fruit sent to market. The poison dealt out of his mouth to his brother man. A man throweth a spear, deadly, but it falleth on the earth and lieth there. But words and sayings are more potent, scoring deep in the soul of things. Fair indeed it is with thee, O Hapacha, and with thy host also, with yonder pure scroll to enter Haraiti. Four, as fast as the ship passed the lights, the Etherian musicians came aboard, being anxious to meet Hapacha and his hosts, especially the Ihens, and to congratulate them on being the first harvest from the lowest heaven at the end of a cycle. And strange to say, there were just twice as many as Sithantis had prepared in the first dawn of Earth. Fragapati called the swift messengers belonging to the Rose of Gone in Etheria, and he said unto them, "Go ye to Sithantis, whose fields lie in the Rose of Gone, and say unto him, Greeting in the name of Jehovah, the Earth hath reached Absad and Gumachala, home of Fragapati." Who sendeth love and joy on behalf of sixty million? First harvest of Hak, grade sixty-five. Five of these messengers, four hundred departed, leaving a reserve of eight hundred, who continued on the avalanche. Six, the Jujas, who were arrayed in gaudy attire, withdrew a little from the landing, fearing the light. When the ship drew near the walls and was made fast, the marshals of Maru came to the front, two million. As an escort to conduct all who chose over the ascending stairs, seven, and so great was the faith of Hapacha's host that over fifty million of them passed within the sea of fire, singing, "Glory be to thee, O Jehovah, Creator of worlds." Eight, seeing this great faith in them, Athrava commanded red and blue lights to favor them, and there was not one of the whole number that quailed or turned from the light, and now was beholden to many of them. Their first view of the glories and powers of gods and goddesses, Maru was illuminated in every part. The structure of the temple, its extent and magnificence in conception, with its hundreds of thousands of mirrors and lenses, its transparent and opaque crystals, translucent and opaque circles and arches, hundreds of millions, the which, when viewed from any one place, was unlike when viewed from another place. As if each position were striving to outdo the others in beauty and perfection, so that were a person to walk for a thousand years in the temple, 
he would every moment see, as it were, a new place of surpassing grandeur. Nine, and so wonderfully was it arranged that the faces of one thousand million people could be seen from any place a person might be, and yet all these people constituted a part and principle in the building, being as jewel stones created by Jehovah for the ornamentation of his celestial abodes. Ten. Hoab, always quick to speak, said, Oh, that angels and mortals would strive to make of themselves such jewels as these. Hepatia spake not, being overwhelmed with the beauty and magnificence. Yet Tante said, When thou art on the throne, Fragapati, I will leave for the kingdom of Yatante. Here, then, I will take my leave. Fragapati shook hands with him, saying, Jehovah be with thee. 11. So Yatante remained where he was, but Hoab and Hepatia continued on with Fragapati. All eyes were turned to them, and especially to Hepatia, whose persistence in faith in Jehovah had won the lower heavens to wisdom and love. And as they moved toward the throne, great Athrava rose up, smiling, holding out his hands to receive them. Next, and back of Athrava, were the five goddesses, Ethro of Uche and Rock. Guisaya of Hemitsa of the valley of Emboid in Etheria, Sitisaya of Wok Tabak, the one time home of Fuervitiv, Sitevi of Nu, Porte Auga and Renava of the swamps of Tholigi, in South Suyark of Rhodes, near Suta and Hichau, in the South Etherian vault of Opsod. 12. And the goddesses also rose up with extended hands, and now because of the brilliancy of their presence, the throne became a scene of hallowed light, and threads thereof extended to all the council members, and by these were radiated outward, so that every person in the temple of Jehovah was connected with the throne, which made every spoken word plain to all. 13. Athrava said, In Jehovah's name, Welcome, O Fragapati, and thy host with thee. The goddesses repeated the same words, and they were echoed by the entire audience. Fragapati said, In thy name, O Jehovah, am I delivered to my loves. Be thou with us, O Father, that we may glorify thee. Receive ye, O my people, Hapacha, son of Jehovah, who rose up and stood in the dark all night long, in faith in Jehovah. Behold, I have delivered him in dawn, and his host with him. 14. And now there appeared, rising like a new sun, Jehovah's light beyond the throne, reddish-tinged, emblem of the western light, in honor of Hepatia. And it rose and stood above Fragapati's head in great brilliancy. Then spake Jehovah out of the light, saying, 15. With my breath create I alive the earthborn child. With my hand quicken I the newborn spirit, and with my light illume I the soul of my faithist. Behold, I dwell in the all highest place, and in the lowest of created things. Whoever findeth me, I find also. Whoever proclaimeth me, I proclaim in return. Hapacha, my son, savior of men, of my light shalt thou be crowned. 16. The voice ceased. And now Fragapati advanced to the midst of the throne, and took the light and fashioned a crown, and placed it on Hepatia's head, saying, Crown of thy crown, O Jehovah, crown I thy son. In thy light shall he be wise and powerful, with love to all thy created beings, henceforth forever. 17. The goddesses then received them, and after due ceremonies, they all took their seats, Fragapati in the midst of the throne. Athrava resigned at once during the stay of Fragapati. The SNRs now chanted, Glory be to thee, O all light, the person of every kingdom high and low, who hath brought our brothers and sisters home. 18. By natural impulse of thanks, Hapacha's host, 50 million, rose up and responded, singing, To thee, O Jehovah, how shall our souls find words? Thy sons and daughters love, how can we recompense? Make us light and clear, O Father, spotless before them and thee. 19. But the anthems were long and sung with brilliancy, 
rejoicing and responding, millions to millions, as an opera of high heaven. 20. When the music ceased, Fragapati said, With the close of dawn of Dan, these hosts shall be received as brides and bridegrooms of Jehovah, and descend with us to the regions of Gutmachala in Etheria. The apportioners will therefore divide them into groups in Haraiti, with Etherian teachers to prepare them. That this may be accomplished, I proclaim one day's recreation to assemble on the next day in order of business. 21. The marshals then proclaimed, as had been commanded, and the hosts went into recreation, the Etherians rushing to Hapatch's atmospherians with great glee, everyone desiring some of them. Chapter 27 When they were called to labor, Fragapati said, For the convenience of my own hosts, the light shall now be raised two degrees, in which case it will be well to permit the hosts of Apacha to retire to the fields of Hukaira in Haraiti, where Thrava hath already a place and teachers for them. 2. Accordingly, the conductors now removed Hapacha's hosts, save about one million, who resolved to endure the light. The SNRs chanted whilst these arrangements were being carried out, and when they were accomplished, the music ceased. 3. The chief marshal said, Swift messengers, who are waiting without, salute Jehovah's throne and his God, and pray an audience. Fragapati said, Whence come they? And what is the nature of their business? 4. The marshal, the marshal said, From the Eowasuan fields of Houts, their business is of the Osivi knots. Fragapati said, On the sign of Emus, admit them. Greeting from God in the Father's name. 5. The marshal withdrew for a short while, and then returned, bringing in 1,000 swift messengers of whom Ariun was goddess. She advanced near the throne to the left. Fragapati said, Goddess Ariun, greeting to thee in Jehovah's name. Proceed thou. 6. Ariun said, Greeting in love to thee, Fragapati, and to all thy hosts. I hastened hither from the fields of house, section 12, on the one-time plateau and place of Horeb, where are a thousand million in naught since many days. This I reported to the Lord God of Japheth, Aowen, whose forces are all employed, and he sent me hither. 7. Fragapati said, It is well. Thou art at liberty. Hoab, canst thou untie the knot? Hoab said, I have faith to try, to which Fragapati replied, Athreva will go with thee, but do thou the labor. Choose therefore thy host from my Etherians, and have a vessel made sufficient, so that if thou find it advisable to bring them away, thou can do so. Retire then with the captain of the files, and make thy selections, and in the meantime, give commands for the vessel to be made, and put in readiness for thee. 8. Hoab said, With Jehovah's help, I will deliver them. And he saluted, and with the captain of the files, he withdrew and made his selections, choosing five million in all, of whom half were physicians and nurses. In the meantime, he had the proper workmen build a vessel of sufficient capacity and strength, as commanded by Fragapati. And in seven days' time, everything was completed, and Hoab commanded his host to enter the ship, and he and Athrava went in also. And presently they were off, being conducted by the goddess Ariun in her arrow ship to the place of the knot. Chapter 28 The goddess Ariun slackened the speed of her arrow ship to suit that of Hoab's vessel. So, onward, together they sped in a direct line, propelled as a rocket is propelled, by constant emissions from the hulk. The witch expenditure is manufactured by the crew and commanders, skilled in wielding Jehovah's elements. For as mortals find means to traverse the ocean and to raise a balloon, so do the gods and spirits build and propel mightier vessels through the firmament, betwixt the stars and over and under and beyond the sun. 2. And when the Aetherians highest raised in the most subtle spheres send their ships coursing downwards in the denser strata of a corporeal world, 
their ready workmen take in ballast and turn the fans and reverse the whirling screws to match the, the space and course of travel, for which purpose men learn the trade, having rank and grade according to proficiency. Many of them serving a thousand years apprenticeship, becoming so skilled in wielding the elements and in the knowledge of the degrees of density, that thousands of millions of miles of roadways in heaven are as a well-learned book to them. 3. And thus, conversant with Jehovah's wide domains, they are eagerly sought after, especially in emergent cases or on journeys of millions of years, for so well they know the requirements, the places of delight, the dangers of vortices and, and of eddies and whirlpools, that when a god saith, take me hither or yonder, they know the nearest way and the power required. 4. For as Jehovah hath made icebergs on the corporeal ocean, dangerous to ships, the heavy currents of trade winds and currents in the oceans, so are there in the Aetherian firmament currents and densities which the well-skilled God can take advantage of, be it a slow trip of pleasure or a swift one on an urgent business to suffering angels or mortals. 5. And be it God or goddesses, dispatched by a higher council to a distant place suddenly, he or she must be already acquainted with navigators sufficiently to know whom to choose, and likewise understand the matter well enough to lend a helping hand if required. For oft the navigators have not swift messengers to pilot them, and yet a short journey of 50,000 miles may require as much skill as a million, especially in descending to a corporeal world. 6. Hoab knew, and he managed well, following close on the arrow's trail till they neared the ruined plateau, and then, amidst the broken currents, Ariun dropped alongside, perceiving Hoab's less wieldy vessel, and made fast. She said to Hoab, 7. Behold, we are near the place. Then Hoab asked, How foundest thou a knot in such a wasted country? Ariun answered him, 8. When Jehovah created woman, he gave her two chief attributes, curiosity and solicitude for others. So, passing here, surveying the place where the first heavenly kingdom was, I remember it had been said that Af left some island places where once a colony in heaven had been built, and I halted to examine it. A moan and terrible sound greeted me. I heard the Osivinots, as I had oft heard other bef others before. 9. We landed and made fast, and presently went about searching, led by the sad, sad noise. Then we came to the great mound, the knot, a thousand million drujas bound in a heap, wailing, muffled, moaning as if all the heap of them were in the throes of death, but could not die. 10. Being myself powerless to overcome such fearful odds, I took the bearings of the regions where I, f where I should find the nearest god, and so, having measured the knot, I set sail as thou hast heard. 11. Hoab said, Every day I behold thy wisdom, O Jehovah. In a new light thy wondrous judgment riseth up before me. Who but thee, O Father, had seen the fruitage of curiosity made perfect in thy daughters, from the little bud seen in mortal form, to the overscanning of thy heavens by such goddesses? 12. As thus Hoab discoursed, they arrived at a suitable landing place, where they made their vessels fast and then hurried to the knot. Without much ado, Hoab walled the knot around with low fire, leaving a gateway to the east, where he placed a thousand sentinels. One million of this army he stationed outside of and beyond the walls, and these were divided into groups of selectors, guardsmen, physicians, nurses, and bearers, and manufacturers of fire and water. The selectors were provided with rods of fire and water and blinds. 13. Then Hoab stationed another million betwixt the knot and the gateway, and these were stationed in four rows, each two rows facing and but two paces apart, so that betwixt the rows it was like a walled alleyway, and the other three million Hoab caused to surround the knot on every side. Each and every one of these was provided with a fire lamp, which they held in the right hand, and when all things were thus in readiness, Hoab commanded the attack to begin, and at once the attackers thrust their fire lamps in the face of the druge nearest by, 
and seizing them with the other hand, pull them away. The Judas do not all relinquish their grip in the knot at sight of the lamp, but often required to be nearly burned and stifled with the light before, before they release their hold. Neither cometh this grip of evil, but of fear. 14. The knot is nothing more nor less than a mass of millions and millions of spirits becoming panic-stricken and falling under their chief or leader, who becometh powerless in their grip, and is quickly rolled up in the midst of the knot. 15. And when the deliverers thus begin at the exterior of the knot, peeling off the crazed and moaning spirits, they hurl them backwards, where they were caught by the seconds, who in turn hurl them into the alleyways, where they are again thrust forward till past the gate in the wall of fire. From the time, therefore, that the druge receiveth the thrust of the fire lamp in his face, he is not suffered to linger, but is whirled suddenly from one to another, so quickly he cannot fasten to any person or thing. For were they to fasten on even the deliverers, first one and then another, soon a second knot would result." Because of which, to untie a knot of a thousand million crazed angels is not only a dangerous proceeding, but a feat of unusual grandeur to be undertaken by five million Aetherians. 16. To provide against accident, Hoab appointed Athrava to take charge of the delivered after they were beyond the walls. For Athrava had been long practiced in such matters, thousands of years. So Athrava divided and arranged the Drujas into groups, placing guardians with fire rods over them, and in some cases taking the groups away and walling them around with fire also. 17. Now by the time 500 million of the knot were released, some of the external delivered groups began to tie themselves in knots. And when Athrava saw this, he said unto Hoab, Behold, they are becoming too numerous for my host. I have not sufficient guardsmen. Hoab said, 18. Then will I cease a while and, instead of delivering, come and assist thee. Accordingly, Hoab suspended the battle for a time, and together they labored with those without, untying the small knots and arranging them in safer ways, placing a greater number of guards over them. 19. This done, the SNR struck up lively music, starting dancing and marching, for such is the routine of the resorting process practiced by the gods. Then come the nurses with cheerful words, with mirth and gaiety, following one diversion with another in rapid succession. But to the raving maniacs, and to the stupid, and to the helpless blind, the physicians now turn their attention. 20. Again, Hoab and his army fell upon the knot, pulling the external ones away and hurling them out, but not so rapidly, having fewer deliverers. For he had bequeathed an extra million to Athraba outside the walls. And after another three hundred million were delivered, Hoab ceased again and joined with Athraba to assist and divide and group them in the same way. And he bequeathed another million of his army to Athraba, and then again resumed the attack on the knot, and thus continued till he reached the core of the knot, having untied the whole thousand million Druja, gradually lessening his own army and enlarging that of Athraba. 21. And when Hoab came to the core of the knot, Behold, he found Oibe, the false god, who falsely styled himself Thor, the Aetherian. And in the midst of the knot, they had jewels of rare value and stolen crowns and stolen symbols and rods and holy water and urns and incest and a broken wheel of Jehovah, a broken triangle of the gods, and, in fact, a sufficiency of things whereof one might write a book in the description. Suffice it, a false god and his kingdom had collapsed, and he fell, crushed in the glory of his throne. And there were with him seven false lords, who were also crushed in the terrible fall. 22. Oibi and his lords, from their conf confinement in the knot, were also crazed and wild with fear, screaming and crying with all their strength, even as were all the others, like drunkards, long debauched, delirious and fearful of imaginary horrors which have no existence. Or as one's hand, long compressed, becometh numb, so that when the pressure is taken away, it still seemeth not free. So would not Oibi nor his lords believe they were free, but still cried, calling for help. 23. At this time, there came from Ahoan, god of Japheth, a messenger with forty companions, 
and with 500 apprentices, and the messenger's name was Turbe, an atmospherian, 300 years, grade two. Greeting from Ahoan in Jehovah's name, Turbe said, to whom shall I speak, to whose honor this deliverance credit, save Jehovah's? Athrava said, 24, to Hoab, a Zeredoan disciple of Fragapati, who was sojourning in Maudu, capital of Haraiti. And Athrava further asked Turbe his name, whence he came, and especially if he knew about this not before, and the history of its cause, to which Turbe replied, 25. From Aowen, this I have learned. Some 400 years ago, one of the sub-gods named Oibe, because of his modesty and bird-like fleetness, was promoted by Samadhi, who is now commissioned master of the Aihwans by Fragapati. This whom Hoab hath delivered is Oibe, the one-time faithful sub-god of honorable purposes. His kingdom prospered for 200 years, and his name and fame spread throughout all these heavens and even down to mortals who were inspired by his admiring spirits to make images of birds, Oibe or Ibis, and dedicated them to Oibe. 26. He became vain of the flattery, and losing faith in Jehovah, finally came out in unbelief, saying there was no all highest, save as each and every god chose to exalt himself. Within his dominions, which numbered nearly a thousand million angels, were a score of more or more of lords under him, to the wisest of whom he began to preach his views, looking to personal laudation and glory. 27. In the course of a score of years, the matter culminated in Oibe and a few of his favored lords proclaiming a new kingdom styled the All Highest Kingdom in the All Highest Heaven, and the title he assumed was Thor, the only begotten son of all light. Thor, the all light personated. Thor, the personal son of Mai, the virgin universe. 28. Thus Oibe cut loose from the true God and his kingdoms, and he immediately walled his kingdom around with a standing army, promoting seven of his most efficient admirers as lords, and others as generals and captains. And at once he set about enlarging and enriching his throne and his capital, which he called Osivi, and known as Haus on the true charts. 29. In the course of 100 years, his kingdom became a place of 2,000 million souls. His chief city, Osivi, was the richest and most gaudy city that has ever been in these heavens. The streets were paved with precious stones. The palaces for himself, his lords, and his marshals and generals were built of the most costly jewels with pillars, arches, and chambers of the most elaborate workmanship and of the most costly material. 30. Oibe became a tyrant, and save his lords and a few favored friends, none were permitted to approach his throne but by crawling on their bellies and even under guard. Nor were they permitted to raise their eyes upon him, save at a very great distance. And all his subjects were his slaves, in fact, though under progressive discipline. These slaves were sent far away into atmospheria, or as down to earth, to gather tribute for the glory of Thor, Oibe and his favorites. Nor did these slaves mistrust, but they were working for Jehovah, believing that he lived in the capital, O.C.V. 31. At first, Thor educated and otherwise improved his slaves, but finding them less obedient in consequence of knowledge, he finally destroyed all the heavenly schools and colleges and resolved to keep his subjects forever ignorant. Consequently, the wiser ones deserted him, save his officers and his angels were without knowledge, knowing nothing, save that they had to work for Thor forever. 32. In addition to ignorance, Thor kept his subjects forever in fear of himself, forever threatening them with terrible punishments if they ceased to pray to him as the only personified all light, Jehovah. And in the course of time, his people forgot all aspiration for any other heaven or any other god. Many of these were deputized to dwell with mortals as guardian spirits, persuading mortals to worship Thor and Ibis, threatening them with being turned into serpents and toads after death if they obeyed not these injunctions. 33. Thus ruled Thor the false for 400 years in Osibi. Neither was it possible for Samadhi to send an army of sufficient strength to overcome such a kingdom. 
But a change finally came. A light descended from the higher heavens six generations ago. And, according to the legends of old, it was ominous that the gods of higher worlds would intercede. 34. So Samadhi, taking advantage of this, sent emissaries to Thor, otherwise Oibi, and solicited him to give over his evil ways and reestablish Jehovah. Thor the false sent back word, saying, When I was a child, I was taught to fear Jehovah, and I feared him. After long experience, I have discovered there is nothing to fear in all the worlds. If there be any Jehovah, he is without form or person or sense. I fear him not. I revere him not. My heaven is good enough for me and my lords. As for my subjects, let no man, nor God, nor Lord meddle with them. 35. Samadhi, who was the lawful God of all these heavens and of the earth, thus perceived no way to reach Thor's slaves, for the slaves were too ignorant to desire any body or thing save Thor. Nevertheless, he sent word to the second time he sent word the second time to Thor, this time saying, Thy kingdom is even now destitute of intelligent people, sufficient to protect thee in case of panic. If a comet or a sudden light or the passage of an avalanche through my dominions should take place, thou wouldst surely find thyself overthrown in a knot. Thy subjects look upon thee as the all-highest. They will surely rush upon thee. 36. Thor sent the messengers back with an insulting answer. Thus the matter stood till after Ehoan's appointment as god of Japheth and her heavens, which had once cut off Thor's emissaries to mortals and confined him within his own kingdom. At this time, Samadhi was commissioned to establish the word of God amongst mortals, but he communicated Thor's position to Ahoan. 37. Ahoan sent ambassadors to Thor, the false, beseeching him in the same manner to give up his personality and return with his kingdom to Jehovah, promising him the best of assistance. To this, Thor, the false, replied by the messengers, saying, 38. Ahoan, thou usurper, if thou desirest favor of me, thou shalt approach me as all gods and angels do, by crawling on thy belly before me. Encroach thou not one jot or tittle on my most high kingdom, or I will banish thee back to the miscreant regions with stripes and curses. 39. Ahoan was surprised, but perceived that till trouble came upon Oibe, nothing could be done for him. So the time came. Jehovah suffered him to go to the full period of self-glory. Thus, Obey fell. 40. Tordba ceased, and Athrava said, O Jehovah, when will man cease to fall? Thou hast proclaimed thyself in all places high and low. Thy gods and lords and countless angels have proclaimed thee. Thou alone art the password to the all universe. Thy name hath a thousand exalted devices to win the souls of mortals and angels from darkness to light, and yet they turn away from thee, thou creator of suns and stars and countless ethereal worlds. And they set up themselves as an object of worship. O, oh, of the smallness of gods and men, O, oh, the vanity of thy little children. 41. Thou hast said to mortals, Go not into the marshes, for there is fever. Built not large cities, for there is sin. Go not after lust, for there is death. But they go in headlong, and they are buried and dead. 42. To those who are risen in heaven, thou hast said, Remember the lessons of earth, lest ye fall. Remember the fate of self-conceit, lest ye be scourged. Remember the king and the queen of earth, how they become bound in heaven, lest ye also become bound. 43. But they will not heed. Vain self riseth up in the soul. They behold no other God but themselves, in whom they acknowledge wisdom.